Katie McClary, and I'm a habitat restoration ecologist with the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. Today, we are standing on the Noble Oaks Conservation Parcel. It totals 662 acres, and the tribe reacquired this parcel through the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program and a partnership with the Nature Conservancy. My name is Greg Archuleta. I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and um, I work with our cultural resources department as a cultural policy analyst and I work a lot on different landscapes in regards to working with tribal partners, restoration, enhancement of our traditional food areas and working for access to different areas for our tribal members for gathering of traditional foods and other plants that we use for other purposes. We use the word uh, TEK, our traditional ecological knowledge and from a tribal perspective, that is pretty much the relationship of the native people, indigenous people to the landscape and how they cared for it and how they connected to the landscape. And it ties to the gathering of our traditional foods, or the caring for the gathering places from a tribal perspective. One of the things I think that's important is that the emphasis is on the plants that were traditionally used by the tribes that were native to the landscape. It also um, relates to the interaction of the tribal people with the landscape. A lot of times these days when you talk about conservation, a restoration, there's that element where you're trying to keep people off the landscape in a sense to enhance it. But from a tribal perspective, that interaction uh, with the people is very important. Like when we gather the camas bulbs, it's important that we're able to gather those camas in regular areas because that digging, gathering of those bulbs continually mixes up the soil so it doesn't hard, get hard and compact over, over time. So if the area is not used, it gets really hard and, and compacted. Uh, the use of fire is another example of TEK, very much, uh, very well documented in the Willamette Valley uh, after contact of, of the tribes using fire on the camas areas, the tarweed areas, um, for the oaks, for the huckleberries, etc. So these are kind of the, the, the relationship that the tr um, tribes have with the landscape and, and how we care for it. And I guess th that would be kind of my kind of definition of a TEK, or traditional ecological knowledge. So historically, the Willamette Valley was maintained by indigenous fire practices. The Kalapuya were the caretakers of the Willamette Valley and burned um, these landscapes to maintain upland prairie, oak savanna, and oak woodland habitats. Without that cultural burning practice, encroachment would occur. And so that's one of the practical applications for TEK that we'll kind of talk about. The tribe desires to restore this parcel back to native habitats to the extent possible. And what we're looking at right now is an upland prairie habitat area um, that was previously managed and restored by the Nature Conservancy. And so today uh, we're here at Noble Oaks as an example of a restoration effort that was begun by the Nature Conservancy and the tri tribe has taken over working with. As you can see, this area is uh, pretty, pretty open. There's a few trees on the perimeter, um, but this is kind of one of the I think important uh, traditional ecological knowledge or TEK concepts, being able to keep these kind of places open. Um, oftentimes if they're not cared for, there's a lot of encroachment um, from trees and grasses or non-native species and things like that. So it's uh, always nice to see these big open areas like this that has a diversity of plant life. This is just kind of one example of, of restoring a landscape the diversity is what's really important here, seeing that diversity. So as we go along today, we'll kind of talk more specifically about these different plants and the different landscapes um, that we have here at Noble Oaks. So what we're looking at here is an upland prairie restoration site. And this is a good example of how woody encroachment can take over. Historically, these landscapes would have been maintained by cultural burning practices, and that would have helped to create a suppression mechanism to prevent some of the woody encroachment that we're observing today. So we're here at another part of Noble Oaks and in the background you can see some of the giant uh, older oak trees. The oak trees are important for our tribes for the acorns 
which were uh, important traditional food. They would usually be gathered in the fall time. If you've ever tried to eat an acorn, it's kind of bitter. So the tribes have ways to leach out the tannin that's in them that makes them bitter. Oak restoration is one of our priorities here at Noble Oaks. Um, and we'll be opening up more areas for the oaks. Oregon white oaks is one of the TEK species um, that's important to the tribe and it's one of the species that is grown at the Tribal Native Plant Materials Program. We're standing in a prairie right now at Noble Oaks. Um, in the background you can see some of the relic, a large open grown white oaks that are indicative of upland prairie and oak savanna habitats. So this is an upland prairie that has been maintained over time by fire. This is um, an example of a historic landscape that would have been maintained by the Kalapuya fire practices. In contrast to one of the prairies that we saw on the other side of Noble Oaks where um, we're not seeing that woody encroachment happening here. Um, and that's because prescribed fire has been applied to the landscape um, over time. And so that has been done historically um, in recent times by the Nature Conservancy in partnership with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and prior to tribal reacquisition, um, the tribal fire program participated in, a, in applications of prescribed fire to this particular prairie. So yellow, uh, well, yeah, wild strawberry. They're a native strawberry and uh, very much used by the tribes today. It's always nice if you can kind of have areas like this, you know, uh, for the strawberries and wild, the trailing blackberry. This is the trailing blackberry or the wild blackberry. Um, it has smaller berries, uh, but they're really good. Our tribes continue to gather and use them. And a landscape for this would be kind of some nice open areas in the forest if there's kind of open sunlight areas. Sometimes they'll produce berries, but the berries won't ripen if it's too shady and things like that. So they need a good amount of sun. A good alternative to the non-native blackberries. This is one of the earlier berries. You might have like the strawberries first and then the service berries. They'll vary by location on taste, but some will have a really nice sweet taste. These berries were commonly dried by the tribes, mashed into cakes and uh, preserved that way or, or mixed with other, uh, like the, the tarweed and the camas and things like that. Um, often these days you see these on the roadsides and things like that. Probably about June, they'll have lots, lots of berries. They'll be in nice clusters, very much edible. Mm -hmm. Iris tanox that's used by our tribes for cordage, for string and things like that. Each of these leaves, when they're mature later in the year, they'll have two threads in each of the leaf, and so we'll work and get those two threads out um, and use it for string and cordage. And that's unique to the Iris tanox. If we find some older ones, uh, leaves, I can show you. A lot of them have been strong yet, the mild winter, and so they've been fairly strong and haven't decayed. And so you can still get the string from them. So here we have the camas, and it's in bloom right now. You see the nice flowers. The bulbs were a very common traditional food of the tribes of the Willamette Valley. And the Kalapuya, some of the, like the Santiam said, they had the best camas of all and it was an important trade item. And today we still continue to gather the camas bulbs. We'll create a ground oven, put in some hot rocks, um, some layers of leaves, um, and then we'll put a layer of the camas bulbs and then more leaves. And then if we're doing multiple families, maybe you have multiple layers like that. And then on top you'll put dirt. And then those hot rocks will help bake the camas and usually bake it from two to three days, four days, and then you want it to caramelize and then it gets a really nice kind of sweet taste. The bulbs, um, if you try to eat them raw or just kind of boil them, um, they have an insulin in them that is not very digestible by humans in the raw form. And so the baking process actually converts that insulin into digestible sugars. And so that's how the tribes used them. Early in the year, they needed some food, say in January, February, when the shoots start, they might take some of those bulbs and boil them. Some will gather them when they're flowering, um, and that's uh, some places where there's the death camas. You wanna be sure you don't get the death camas bulbs, um, so they would gather them during that period so they knew which bulb they were getting um, for safety kind of things. 
but usually kind of wait till after they go to seed. Um, then all that energy goes back into the bulbs. And then that would be the primary gathering time for them. Later in the summer through the fall time, they can be gathered. After they're baked, they were dried. Calipuy like to make different types of cakes, some of them round, um, just pounded into cakes. Um, sometimes mixed with the tarweed, hazelnuts, and then those store very well. And then uh, fire, fire was, as mentioned, was a very important traditional ecological knowledge method for caring for them. Encourage new growth to keep the prairies open where they grew. Fire would be used a lot on the Camas prairie areas, Camas meadows. So this is another one of our traditional foods, the yampa. And later in the year, summer, it'll have flowers on it. But the root is used by our tribes. It's edible. You can just gather that root and it, clean it and eat it that way. You can peel off the outer skin. And then also it was uh, gathered and uh, ground up into flour too and, and used that way. A fairly common plant throughout Willamette Valley. Historically it was and now it's a little more rare. So we're working at restoration efforts and it's a kind of a nice plant to have on the landscape if you can add that to the area. Um, it'll vary from kind of little wet kind of areas to more drier areas. So this is tarweed. This is a kind of a wild sunflower. And the seeds are smaller than the sunflowers most people are familiar with. This used to be very common in the Willamette Valley, uh, one of the primary foods of the tribes of Western Oregon. As it gets older, it'll have a flower, yellow kind of flower, and it also it gets very tarry, kind of sticky. What the tribes would do is when they're ready to gather this, they'd have big open areas of where this would be growing, and then they would light those fields or areas on fire to burn off that tarry substance. And then they had a seed fan and a basket to collect, so they'd knock those stalks and the seed into the basket. Sometimes it still had the outer seed on them, so they would parch them. They had flat baskets. They put hot coals on there and put the seed in there. That still had the shell on. And then they would um, keep that moving, and that heat from those hot coals would crack that outer shell, and they'd winnow out um, that hard shell, and then be just left with the seed. And then the seed would be ground up into a flour um, mixed with berries, the camas, other foods. Um, and kind of made into cakes too and kind of stored that way also for winter time. So there was a lot of efforts to eradicate it because of that sticky stuff on them and get on the livestock. Today we're trying to get it reestablished and be more common. They'll crush it also for the oils in it. You know, today in the store you can buy the sunflower oil. It's similar, kind of has the oils too that can be um, crushed and gotten from the, the wild, um, the tarweed also. Mm -hmm.